2015 Canadian Open Mathematics Challenge Part C. A quadratic polynomial f at x is equal to x squared plus px plus q, where p and q are real numbers, is said to be double up polynomial if it has two real roots, one of which is twice the other. If a double up polynomial f at x has p equals minus 15, determine the value of q. So we have f at x is equal to x squared plus px plus q. And they're saying that p is minus 15, so it's minus 15x plus q. And the roots, according to their definition, if the roots, let's say, are a and b, one root is equal to twice the other, so a is equal to 2b. So if we were to put in the roots x minus a, x minus b, that would be a valid equation. But one of these is equal to twice the other, um, so we will incorporate that. But first, let's expand this out. So this will be x squared minus x uh, a minus x b plus a b, and that, of course, is equal to this side. So if we collect like terms, we will get minus a minus b and then, then plus a b. So now what we will do is we will uh, compare the coefficients. So in this, the coefficient in front of x is minus 15. On this side, the coefficient for x is minus a minus b. So those two coefficients are equal. So that means that 15 is equal to a plus b. Now a is equal to 2b, so we can substitute that in. So 15 is equal to 2b plus b and therefore 15 is equal to 3b, and therefore b is equal to 5. And therefore a, since a is equal to 2 times b, a would be equal to 10. And now, again, comparing coefficients, q is equal to ab. So q is equal to a times b. Well, a we just figured out is 10, b we just figured out was 5. So 10 times 5 is 50, and that is the value for Q. Part B says, if f at x is a double up polynomial with one of the roots equal to 4, determine all possible values of p plus q. f at x, if you recall, is x squared plus px plus q. And Again, I'll just use the same roots uh, in terms of my variables a and b. So that means x squared plus px plus q is equal to x minus a times x minus b. Okay, well, they told me that one of the roots is equal to 4. So I'll just say a is equal to 4. So that means this becomes x minus 4. And then, well... We are told in the first part that one root is equal to twice the other root, right? So if one is 4, then the other one has to be 8. Or the other way of thinking about it is that b was 4, and therefore uh, a is 2. right? If you're saying, for example, that b is equal to 2 times a, where one root is twice the other. So I guess we have two scenarios. So it looks like we'll have to do this twice. Okay, not a problem. So the first scenario is x minus 4 using these two roots and x minus 8 and that's equal to this x squared plus px plus q. Okay, so let's expand this and when you do you get x squared minus 12x plus 32. So that means that if I compare coefficients, p is my minus 12 and q is my 32. So therefore, p plus q is equal to 20 in this case. Yeah. Okay, so that takes care of that guy. Now let's concentrate on this one. That one, in a very similar way, would give me that x minus 2 and x minus 4. So x squared minus 6x plus 8, and that means that p is minus 6, and q is 8. 
So therefore, P plus Q is 2. So there you go. Those are the, po the two possible values of P plus Q, either 20 or 2. Determine all double up polynomials for which P plus Q is equal to 9. x squared plus px plus q, again we'll use the same uh, variables, x minus a and x minus b. And remember, one root is equal to twice the other, so b is equal to 2a. So let's just put that in right away, x minus a, x minus 2a, like that. And then let's expand this, so x squared minus 3a plus 2a squared. And that is equal to x squared plus px, forgot the x there, plus q. So comparing coefficients, uh, that means that, well, we've got, oh, sorry, I forgot I got the x here. p is equal to minus 3a, and q is equal to 2a squared. And they also tell me that p plus q is equal to 9. So p plus q is equal to 9. So that means that minus 3a plus 2a squared is equal to 9. Put everything on one side. 2a squared minus 3a minus 9 is equal to 0. Uh, I don't think this factors nicely. I have to use a quadratic. Okay, no problem. 3 plus or minus square root of 3 squared minus 4 2 times minus 9 all over 2 times 2. So that's going to be a is 3 plus or minus uh, 4 times 2 times 9, 6 times 9, 54. Sorry, 8 times 9, 72 plus 9. So that's 81 all over 4. So that's going to be 3 plus or minus 9 over 4. So that looks like 12, 3 or minus 3 over 2. Okay. All right. Now, what do they want me to figure out? Uh, determine, oh, just the polynomial. Uh, okay. All right. So I guess if the root is A equals 3, then that means B is equal to 6, right? Because B is equal to 2A. So that polynomial basically would be X minus 3 times X minus 6. And that's going to be x squared minus 9x plus 18. If we use this guy, a being minus 3 over 2, then b is minus 3. So that means the polynomial is x plus 3 over 2, right? Because it's minus minus 3 over 2 times x minus minus 3, so x plus 3. If you expand that, you get x squared plus uh, 3 plus 3 over 2, so 9 over 2x plus 9 over 2. Yeah, so these are the two polynomials that satisfy the conditions. Let O00, zero zero Q13, 4, A, 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 B, B0, where A and B are positive real numbers with B greater than or equal to A. The point Q is on the line segment AB. Determine the values of A and B for which Q is the midpoint of AB. So let's draw a very basic diagram. And this is obviously the origin. And B is somewhere here. I have no idea what the value is. B is 0. And let's see here. 13, 4 is the midpoint, so I guess A is going to be eh, somewhere here, I guess. And then the midpoint will be right here. So this is 13, and this is 4. So I guess if we join this, it'll look something like that. Something like that, where this is the midpoint. So let's label this now. This is A, this is B, and the midpoint is, what are they calling it? Q. And that's 13, 4. Okay. And determine the values of A. Okay. And that's A, A. All right, if it's a midpoint, just use the midpoint formula. 13 is equal to A plus B over 2. 
and 4 is equal to a plus 0 over 2. So immediately we get a equal to 8. And then sub that back into here is 26 would be 8 plus b. So b would be 18. And I think that's it. Yeah, we determine the values of a and b. All right, moving right, right along. Uh, let's see here. Determine all values of a and b for which q is on the line segment ab and triangle OAB is isosceles and right angled. So I think we have a few scenarios here. Um, scenario 1, scenario 2, and then a scenario 3 also. And let's go through each one. So the first scenario is when OA is equal to OB. So let's uh, OA is equal to AB. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. So what that means is that if you've got this diagram and A is here, you're going to have this kind of situation where the right angle is at A and this is equal to that. So this is O, this is A, and this is B. Okay, so if that's the situation, then we can easily figure this out. This is AA, so the distance from O to A, well, that's easy because this is A and this is A. So it's just going to be, if you draw a line right there, uh, it's just going to be A squared plus A squared square root, which is root 2A. And then since it's a right angle triangle, we can use Pythagorean theorem that OA plus AB squared is equal to OB squared. And since OA is equal to AB, both of them are root 2A. Root 2A all squared plus root 2A all squared. OB. Yeah, OB squared. So that looks like what? Uh, 2A squared plus 2A squared is equal to OB squared. So that's 4A squared is equal to OB squared. So OB is therefore equal to 2A. Okay. And I guess we need a, uh, to utilize this point uh, Q, which is the midpoint, which is 13, 4. And we will also utilize the line AB. So the line AB, uh, that equation obviously is at y equals mx plus b. And we can figure out the slope since this is b0. So the slope m would be a minus 0 over a minus b, but ob we just figured out was 2a, so that means b is equal to 2a, right? Because that's the distance from o to b. So we can just put in a over a minus 2a, so that looks like a over negative a, which is negative 1. So that is y is equal to negative x plus b and then to get the value for b let's just substitute at any point and 13 4 is on that line so 4 would be my y value minus 13 plus b and therefore b is 17 and a we can figure out from that formula that a is equal to b over 2 so that would be 8.5 so there we go we just figured out a and b for this scenario right here the second scenario, I guess, would be if we have OB equal to AB. If that's the case, then this diagram would be a little bit different. It would look like this, actually, like that. Well, this is O, this is B, and this is A, and OB is equal to AB, so the right angle is here. If that's the case, and look at these coordinates, B0 and AA. Since AB is a vertical line, 
that basically means that this A and this B are the same. A is equal to B, like that. And Q, which is a point uh, that it represents the midpoint of AB, so approximately here, Q13, 4. Well, since that's AB is a vertical line, A and 13 and B are the same. So A equals 13, which equals B. So that means A is 13 and B is 13. And that's it. And then the third scenario is a scenario where OA equals OB. And if that was the case, then the diagram would look like this, where this is O, this is A, and this is B. And OA is equal to OB, and the right angle is there. But this one is not possible because A has the coordinates AA. A. And if that is a vertical line, then its x coordinate would be 0. So this would be 0, 0. And obviously, it's not 0, 0. So it falls apart. So here, there's no solution when you set that scenario. So the only uh, possible values are that for this scenario and that for this scenario. There are infinitely many line segments AB that contain the point Q. For how many of these line segments are A and B both integers? So what they're saying is, again, you've got this scenario where this was B, this is A, and this is Q, right? Q is the midpoint. But you can also draw a line like this where this is A, this is Q, and this is B. And you can just keep going, right? A, Q, B. So there's infinitely many lines. So they're saying, for how many of these lines are A and B both 0? Remember, the coordinates for B were B0, and the coordinates for A were small a, small a. So they want that small a and small b to both be integers. OK, so to figure that out, we have to look at the slope of the line AB. Slope of the line AB, rise over run. Uh, we can also use. 13, 4, since it's on the line AB. So the slope from A to Q would be equal to the slope from Q to B, since it's on the same line. I'm just breaking it up into two segments. From A to Q, the slope would be A minus 4 over A minus 13. Q to B, that slope would be 4 minus 0, 13 minus B. All right, so cross multiply. And you get a minus 4 times 13 minus b is equal to 4 times a minus 13. OK, so let's expand this. 13a minus ab minus 52 plus 4b is equal to 4a minus 52. Put everything on one side. And when you do, you get. Let's see here, 4a minus 4b um, plus ab minus 13a. Okay. Uh, that doesn't look like it can factor very well. Let's see if I can rearrange this a bit. ab mm, minus 4b. We'll keep those the same. And then... Oh, this can, can combine. This is minus 9a. Yeah, I forgot to combine that. Ah, OK, OK. Uh, I still don't think it factors. But if we, 4 times 9 is 36. So if I can put a 36 out here, like this, and then I, of course, I have to do the same thing to the other side, then this can factor very ni nicely, a, b, 4, and 9 minus minus yeah okay great so now I've got to do this by inspection I've got to make a table here and sort of figure out what possible values I will have for my uh, a and B so we've got a minus 4 and then we've got B minus 9 and then I can figure out a and B okay so a minus 4 times b minus 9 
is equal to 36. So the possibilities are 1 and 36, 2 and 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, um, 6 and 6, 9 and 4, 12 and 3, 18 and 2, and 36 and 1. So for each of these, if a minus 4 is 1, then a is obviously 5. And if b minus 9 is 36, then b is 45. So we can easily calculate these values. 6, 27, 7, 21, 8, and 18, 10, and 15, 13, 13, 16, 12, 22, 11, and 40, and 10. Okay. Well, it looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All nine scenarios have A and B both integers, but be careful because there was a condition that we have to meet here. Now, right here, I think that's kind of tricky that it's buried deep in the question that B has to be greater than or equal to A. So since B has to be greater than or equal to A, we can only use such cases, and that means uh, these ones. We can't use these guys because B is not greater, the, greater than or equal to A. So those six, so how, what are they asking? How, for how many of these line segments? So six line segments, six line segments have both the values of small a and small b equal to integers. If n is equal to 3, determine all integer values of m such that m squared plus n squared plus 1 is divisible by m minus n plus 1 and m plus n plus 1. So n is equal to 3, so we want m squared plus n squared plus 1 to be divisible by m minus n plus 1. And we also want m squared plus n squared plus 1 to be divisible by m plus n minus plus 1. Okay, so substituting n equals 3, we get m squared plus 9 plus 1, which is 10, all over m minus 3 plus 1, so m minus 2. And this has to be some integer, so we'll call it k1. Uh, that's what it means. If something is divisible, it results in, in an integer. And very similarly over here, this is also m squared plus 10, but this time this will be m plus 4, and that also equals some integer. k1, k2 are elements of the family of integers. Okay, so let's go with this here. Uh, hmm. Okay, so I think I'm going to have to factor that somehow let me see here, m minus 2, m plus 2. If I expand that, I get m squared minus 4. So I've got a 10 here, so somehow I've got to manipulate that. Uh, if I add 14, I think that will do it. So m squared minus 4 plus 14, if I break up that 10 into 14 minus 4, then I'll should, I should be able to factor this. So now this m squared minus 4 factors into m minus 2, m plus 2, and then I have that 14 all over m minus 2. So that means this is m minus 2. If I break it up, m plus 2 all over m minus 2 plus 14 over m minus 2. So this cancels with that, so you're just left with m plus 2 plus 14 over m minus 2 like that. Okay, this, of course, is equal to some integer. Well, m is uh, an integer. They've told me that already. So this will always be an integer. But I've got to make this an integer also in order for k to be an integer. So that means that 14 divided by m minus 2 is an integer. So that means m minus 2 has to be a factor of 14. So m minus 2 has to be equal to either 14, 7, 2, or 1. 
Now, does it say anything about positive integers? No, just all integer values. So I guess they could be negative also. Okay, so that means plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus, and so on. Okay, so if m minus 2 is plus or minus 14, we can easily calculate the values of m now. m will be either 16, 9, 4, 3, minus 12, minus 5, 0, and 1. All right, so there we go. Now we're going to do the exact same thing, but this time over here. Now I've got to factor out m plus 4. So let's see here, m plus 4, m minus 4. That will give me m minus 16. So how I'm going to break up that 10 would be 26, 26 minus 16. Yeah, so minus 16 plus 26. That would end up as 10. Yeah, okay. I think that'll work. So then m plus 4. So this will become m minus 4, m plus 4 plus 26 over m, all over m plus 4. In a very similar way, break it up. M minus 4, M plus 4 over M plus 4. And then this is 26 over M plus 4. So then this cancels with that. We have M minus 4 plus 26 over M plus 4. And that is equal to my integer. As before, this is always going to be an integer since M is an integer but we have to make sure that this is an integer in order for k to be an integer. So that means that m plus 4 is one of the divisors of 26. So either plus or minus 26, plus or minus 13, plus or minus 2, or plus or minus 1. And in that case, m would be 22, 9, negative 2, negative 3, minus 30, minus 17, minus 6, or negative 5. Okay, great. But we want both of these things to occur. We want this to occur and that to occur. In order for both to occur, we have to get uh, m that's common to both sets. So when you look through both sets, what's common? Well, m equals 9 is in both sets, and equal m equals negative 5 is in both sets. And those are the only two values of m. So m equals 9 and negative 5 satisfies the conditions of that question. Show that for any integer n, there is always at least one integer value of m for which m squared plus n squared plus 1 is divisible by both m minus n plus 1 and m plus n plus 1. All right. In the previous part, if you remember, just 10 seconds ago, we got m is equal to negative 9. Uh, sorry, 9 and, and, and uh, 5, uh, negative 5. And that was when n was equal to 3. Correct? So that makes me think that there might be some relationship here. If I use 9 and 3, I have m equal to n squared, correct? Since m is 9, n is 3. So let's consider this. Let's use this. m squared plus n squared plus 1, therefore, would become n to the power of 4 plus n squared plus 1, if I make this substitution. Now, this factors into n squared, n squared, 1, 1, plus n minus n. Yeah. And they're saying that this is divisible by both this and this. So that means that this uh, is divisible by both this and this. So basically what it means is that this is divisible by m minus n plus 1 and m plus n plus 1. Well, m is equal to n squared, so make that substitution. So this is n squared minus n plus 1 and n squared plus n plus 1. Well, it's true. 
n squared plus n plus 1 is divisible by this guy, obviously, since they're the same. And then this part of it, n squared minus n plus 1, is divisible by this, since they're the same value. So just by making that one substitution, you're able to easily prove that uh, that this original equation is divisible by both that and that for all integers n. Show that for an integer n, there are only a finite number of values m for which m squared plus n squared plus 1 is divisible by both m minus n plus 1 and m plus n plus 1. So as before, m squared plus n squared plus 1 has to be divisible by m minus n plus 1. So that means it has to equal some integer. And the other one, m squared plus n squared plus 1, also has to be divisible by m plus n plus 1 where k1 and k2 are integers. That's what this means, element of the integers. All right, so if you re rewrite this, what we get is the following. If we rewrite this guy, we can rewrite it as follows. m minus n plus 1 times m plus n minus 1 plus 2 times n squared minus n plus 1. If you expand this, you'll find that it, it equals exactly that. Now, the purpose of doing that is we have to now show that this is divisible by, for example, this m minus n plus 1. Now, if this is divisible by m minus n plus 1, then that means we can put this over that. And we can expect to get an integer as an answer, say so call it k1. But we have made this substitution, or we've made that, uh, not substitution, but uh, we've modified it to look in a different format. So let's also apply that denominator to that side, m minus n plus 1 m plus n minus 1, put it over m minus n plus 1, and then we'll also do the same here, 2n squared minus n plus 1, all over m minus n plus 1. Well, over here, this cancels with that, so all we're left with is m plus n minus 1, and then 2 times n squared minus n plus 1, all over m minus n plus 1. And they're saying that that is equal to some integer. Well, m and n are integers, so that's always going to be an integer. So we have to now concentrate on this. As before, this has to be a divisor of that. So just as before, for any given value of n, we have to have m minus n plus 1 as a divisor of the numerator, which is n squared minus n plus 1. And as we showed before, there's only going to be a finite number of such divisors. There's only a finite number of such uh, divisors, right? It doesn't go on forever. You know, like previously we showed there was, what, I think eight divisors or something like that. So the key word there is finite. And therefore, we can conclude that... Hence, there are only a finite number of values for m. And that should be sufficient for this part of the question. Mrs. Whitlock is playing a game with his math class to teach them about money. Mr. Whitlock's uh, math class consists of n greater than 2 students, whom he has numbered 1 through n. Mr. Whitlock gives m i greater than or equal to zero dollars to student i with i between one and n.
inclusive, where m i is an integer and m one plus m two dot 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 to m n is greater than one. We say a student is a giver if no other student has more money than they do, and we say a student is a receiver if no other student has less money than they do. To play the game, each student who is a giver gives one dollar to each student who is a receiver. It is possible for a student to have a negative amount of money after doing so. This process is repeated until all students have the same amount of money, or the students reach a distribution of money that had previously reached. Okay. Given values of n, m1 through mn, for which the game ends with at least one student having a negative amount of money, n show that the game does indeed end this way. All right, so let's explain this first. I will explain this so with an example. Let's just give a simple example. Let's say we have five students. So n is equal to five. So we have student one, student two, student three, and student four, and student five. Okay. Now let's say they all have to start off with a certain amount of money, right? Because Mr. Whitlock gives them uh, some money. Either uh, he gives them uh, nothing, or he gives them one dollar, two dollar, whatever. Because it says here um, he gives them m greater than zero dollars. Okay, so let's say he gives uh, zero to that student, one dollar, two dollars, five dollars, and seven dollars. Okay, so then we start looking at this part of the question, which is the giver and receiver stuff. A student is a giver if no other student has more money than they do. So this guy is the giver right here. A student is a receiver if no other student has less money. So this is the receiver. Okay, so what happens? To play the game, each student who is a giver gives $1 to each student who is a receiver. Okay, so then that means $1 is given by M5 to M0. So then this person will have $1, this person would have $6, and I guess the other ones don't do anything. So that's what happens. And then you just keep going like this. So who's the giver now and who's the receiver? Well, it looks like M5 is still the giver, but now we've got two receivers. See what I mean? Because they both have are tied. So now again, the giver gives one dollar to the receivers. Uh, yeah. So then this becomes two dollars, two dollars. But he's given two dollars away, so now he's down to four. This is still five, and this is still two. But now the situation has changed. Now we got a new giver, and we've got three now receivers. So then once one more round, and uh, one more round. The giver gives a dollar to each of these, so three, 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 and he's given away three, so he's down to two, and that's four. Now, we've got a new giver and a new receiver, and you just keep going, so I hope that makes sense. This process is repeated until all students either have the same amount, meaning they're all tied, or the students reach a distribution of money that has previously reached, meaning they're right back where they started. And if they're right back, not necessarily right back where they started, but right back to a previous state, and then it would essentially be the same. So I hope that makes sense. So let's see. Let's see what we can play around with, with A. Given values of n, m1 through mn, for which the game ends with at least one student having a negative amount of money, show that the game does indeed end this way. Okay. All right, so let's just start off again with the n equals 5. Um, and then we've got M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. Okay. And the key is to choose a scenario that's going to help us uh, reach their findings. And after some fiddling around, you can start with 0, 0, 0, 1, and 2. And this should work. So let's explain. Who's the giver here? The giver is this guy, M5. Who's the receiver? Well, these guys are the receivers because they have the lowest amount. Okay, so let's play the game. The giver gives $1 to each of the receivers. So this is 1 now, this is 1, this is 1. He's given away $3, so now he's down to negative 1. Because remember, a negative, um, it is possible to have a negative amount of money. And this guy stays at 1. Okay. Play the game again, but who's the giver, who's the receiver? These guys are all givers now, and this guy is the receiver. 
So the giver gives the receiver, the givers give the receiver one dollar each. So now he's getting four dollars. So now he's up to three. Each of these drop down to zero. Okay. All right. So let's keep going. Keep the game going. This guy is the giver, and these guys are now the receivers. The giver gives the receiver one dollar each. So one, one, one. But he's giving away four dollars. So now he's back down to negative one. But watch what happened. We this is the exact same as this. So that is what this means. That this process is repeated until they have the same amount of money or the students reach a distribution of money that has previously reached. They have indeed reached a distribution of money that has been previously reached. This was previously and then they reached the same distribution again. And that's when the game ends. So Part A basically says, give values of n, m1. We gave n equal to 5, and we gave these values for m1 through m5, for which the game ends with at least one student having a negative amount. This is where the game ends. And one student has indeed a negative amount. And show that the game does indeed end this way. The reason the game ends is not because of the negative amount. The game ends because we have reached a distribution of money that had been previously reached and in our case it was reached at that point of the game so that's pretty much all of point a is trying to show suppose there are n students determine the smallest possible value kn such that m1 plus m2 dot 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 mn is greater than or equal to kn then no player will ever have a negative amount of money. All right. So let's say you have n players. And therefore, we will have uh, all these guys, right? M1, M2, M3, dot, 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 all the way till Mn. Okay. So let's start off. We, again, have to fiddle around to try to get some values here. Let's start off with... Uh, N1 having a value of money equal to, let's just put money, equal to N minus 2. And these guys all having the same amount, and that being N minus 3. N minus 3 dot dot dot. Now let's play the game. So the, the who's the giver, who's the receiver? The giver is the guy with the highest amount of money, so this is guy is the giver. And these guys are all tied, so they're going to be the receiver because they have the less amount of money. When you play the game, the giver has to give $1 to each of these receivers. So they would be $1 more, so they'd be back up to N minus 2. When they get $1, N minus 2 is basically... Um, one more than n minus three okay but g had to give one dollar to each of them and how many of them are there well there's n minus one of them right because this is one and there's n minus one of the other guys since the total is n so we have to figure out what does he end up with well, let's do it on the side he started with n minus two then he gave away one dollar to each of those n minus 1 players. So he's n minus 2 minus n plus 1, so that looks like he's down to negative 1. Okay, so he's down to negative 1. Okay, well, that falls apart because it's saying we have to show a scenario where no player will ever have a negative amount of money. Well, this guy just came up with negative 1, so this scenario fell apart, so no good. Okay, not a problem. Let's try again. Right? He started with n minus 2 and ended up with negative 1. So what if he starts with a dollar more? Could he then end up with 0? Let's see. So instead of starting with n minus 2, let's say he starts with a dollar more, which would be n minus 2 plus 1, which is n minus 1. And then each of these guys, we'll just keep them at n minus 3, m1, m2, m3, all the way up until mn. And let's see what happens. Let's play the game now. 
This guy, of course, is still the giver, and these guys are still the receivers. So the giver gives $1 to each of the receiver, so these guys will then have n minus 2, n minus 2, dot, 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 like that. Now we have to figure out what goes here. What did he end up with? Okay, well, we'll do it on the side. He started with n minus 1, and then he had to give $1 to each of those players, and there's n minus 1 of them. Okay. So, let's see. This is n minus 1 minus n plus 1, so 0. So he ends up with 0. Okay, that, that fits because it's not negative. So that works. So that works. We just, it won't work if it's negative. All right, so the, what, what do they want? They want the, the smallest value k, where k is the sum. Ah, okay, k is the sum. So in this case, what is the sum? Well, the sum is m1 plus m2 all the way till mn. Ah, okay. So in this case, this was m1, right? This is m2, this was m3, dot, 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 all the way to mn. So to the sum looks like 0 plus all of these n minus 2s, and there's n minus 1 players, right? So I just have to multiply n minus 1 times n minus 2. Okay, so this is n squared minus 3n plus 2. Okay, I guess that's what they want. That's k, and that's equal to k, kn. And I guess that's the conclusion. Because this is a scenario that works. And you can keep playing the game here to see that indeed no player will have a negative amount to verify that, that this does indeed fit the conditions of the question.